Yeah, we just did the state of GeoServer, which is kind of what's new for GeoServer, what we've done this year. And honestly, um, this talk is really about what's actually good in GeoServer, what we found cool to implement. Uh, yeah, you know, things that were fun and exciting. Are you ready? I, I know it's just after the social night, but yeah, we'll try and keep this up. So this is the 10,000 feet view, all the data sources, the services, and uh, the outputs. As you can see, there is a lot going on. We even don't have the OGC API features and uh, all the other OGC APIs in, in here, but the, the, the slide is already overflowing. Uh, many of these functionalities are provided by extensions. So the server has a core functionality, and then you have a bunch of plugins that you can download to add more. Uh, let's have a look topic by topic about what you can do. So. One of the most popular things about GeoServer is you can actually configure it. You don't have to wander into like XML files like the bad old days. There's a UI, and you can poke away, and stuff happens. Um, yeah, still poking. Stuff is still happening. We're publishing layers. Yay, us. One thing that's really nice is that there's an interactive style editor, so you can actually see the style on the screen, uh, change settings and fonts and so on, and get an interactive feedback. Um, but you're not limited to just point and click. There's also a REST API if you happen to want to automate or if you're making tools that uh, want to configure Geos very remotely. Um, and if you need to mass configure layers, there's actually an extension called Importer, which lets you, I don't know, point at an entire PostGIS database or point at a directory of spatial files and publish the, same, the whole thing. And it's got a GUI and it's got a REST API. There's also a backup and restore community module that allows you to uh, backup the, the data directory, the configuration, and restore it either later or in a different environment, uh, possibly in combination with the, the uh, environment parameterization so that you can change database connections, users, and whatnot, uh, environment by environment. It works asynchronously. It has a UI. It has a REST interface. So let's move on to vector data stores. We get lots of kind of different file supports, shape files, geo packages. Uh, there's an extension that lets you uh, bridge over to GDAL and support any of the formats that are available there. Uh, databases, we like them. If you have a spatial database, you're already ahead of the game. Uh, PostGIS, Oracle, Oracle is a killer feature for folks. Um, Teradata is kind of on the way out. Yeah. Uh, MySQL. Uh, SAP, SQL Server, all kinds of things. Um, we also have cloud services. Does that happen later, or is that slide just doesn't exist? Uh, most of the cloud services are actually compatible with uh, the mm, desktop version, let's say the server versions of the, of the services, so you, you get uh, support for PostgreSQL and others in the cloud, MySQL, yeah. and uh, it just but works. Also things like GeoMesa and so forth. Uh, curves, if your geometries happen to, I don't know, not be on the straight and narrow, uh, we're willing to support them. So uh, Oracle, uh, PostGIS, and so on supports curves, and we're happy to do that. Uh, there's an SQL view functionality, which isn't really an SQL view. If you have an SQL view in your database, you can publish that. But there's a feature in, in GeoServer called SQL view where you can type in a query and get the results published as a layer. Uh, you can actually even change your mind about what the SQL view is doing and parameterize it, feed it in values um, uh, on the fly, and have different queries and joins performed. No SQL, if you're against the whole SQL, we've got Solar and Elasticsearch and MongoDB as different data sources. Uh, this is a new feature that I'm really happy to see. Didn't we have something like this in GeoServer 1? I wasn't there. Ah, ooh, harsh, harsh. Uh, so this allows you to take your feature type as it comes out of your database. And you know, if it's a shapefile, you could actually give it real long names. Uh, you could change the types and so on. Uh, really a, a happy feature. It also lets you type in small expressions so you can derive new, uh, new columns on the fly. Here's my, here's my cloud services, so GeoMesa, GeoWave, and Hadoop. Get your Spark on. Uh, raster data sources. OK, so we support the run of the mill uh, data sources like uh, GeoTIFF, uh, R-Grid, simple mosaics, complex mosaics, GeoPackage made uh, of tiles, all, all of uh, the above. Uh, we support uh, Kakadu, uh, Nitro, LibJPEG Turbo, GDAL data sources. We added support for libdeflate to make uh, it faster to handle deflate compression. And of course, we support lots in terms of mapping from basic styling to more complex styling. This is a real word from France. 
Uh, we support uh, OSM, and uh, if you go to the Solutions uh, repository, you will find the OSM styles repository with uh, CSS styles that you can download and use. Uh, we have uh, pretty good support for uh, on-the-fly reprojection win with uh, date line wrapping, cutting on the projection limits, dealing with stereographic, which is also very fun, uh, and uh, densifying on the on-the-fly uh, long lines to make them smooth. Uh, if you want to play with uh, Mapbox vector tiles, we got support for them both as, in, as input and as output. Um, and uh, of course, uh, along with the vector tiles comes uh, an integrated tile cache, which is Geo Cache. I delivered a state of Geo Cache a couple of days ago. And it supports all the raster tiles, but also the vector tiles. You can store stuff in, uh, in, uh, on the file system, on the cloud, and so on. So it's a pretty good integrated tile cache. It runs integrated with uh, uh, some perks like, uh, uh, I don't know, you change the style, it's going to drop the, the cache for you because it's outdated, stuff like that. Um, and um, um, we okay. can deliver a lot of data. In addition to drawing your data, we can actually just share it out with the public. So uh, Web Feature Service is the way to offer direct uh, vec access to your vector data. Uh, web Coverage Service allows people to come in and sample uh, and uh, collect some of your raster data. Uh, CQL uh, is a very small uh, kind of text language similar to an SQL where expression. So it's a little domain specific language that you can use to filter your contents, uh, select what you want to see drawn on the map and so forth. Uh, and then we've extended it for eCQL, which allows us to uh, use the functions, be a bit more flexible and so forth. Um, the original superpower of, uh, of GeoServer is actually the ability to edit your data. So the Web Feature Service protocol has this, this uh, operation called transaction, which is allows people to remotely edit data. So you could load up a layer uh, in QGIS, and then you could use QGIS to edit the data remotely or make it a uh, mobile data collection app. Um, the other kind of fun superpower here is something called app schema. So if you're a scientist or if you've got an obligation to publish data in a specific format, known as an application schema, you can map your tables, your information to that application schema and uh, you know, meet your regu regulatory requirements. If complex GML is uh, um, making your eyes bleed, in, uh, no problem. In 2020, we started supporting also complex ge GeoJSON output, and we have a, a module called Features Templating that allows you to uh, switch from uh, simple features to, let's say, complex outputs for both JSON and XML um, with sim simpler templates. It's a, a little bit easier than um, up schema. We have support for Inspire. Uh, in uh, the capabilities documents, and now, uh, as you've seen in our pre previous presentation, uh, in uh, uh, all the, the rest of the protocol through the language parameter. We okay. yeah. Moving on to processing. So in addition to publishing your data, we offer options for remote analysis. Uh, so we've got an, an integrated web processing service. So this allows you to do many of the analyze, pub uh, uh, publish and so on, and then lots of great effects uh, like making heat maps or contour lines are available. Um, yeah. So this uh, is a simple example of extending the existing protocols such as WFS and WCS for download. Uh, we have a WPS process that allows us to, you know, uh, make large and downloads, filter, clip, and uh, eventually build uh, large maps or animations in, in a way that will not time out on you. But you can also think big and uh, have uh, GeoServer talk to a processing grid and expose the processes that are there. Um, uh, we just are pretty much acting as a protocol proxy for it. Uh, it's also interesting to see what uh, we can do when we put together WPS and uh, uh, styling. So we can do stuff like on-the-fly contour extraction, but also NDVI or whatever index you want, a calculation through the GFOL uh, map algebra, and uh, you can extract uh, wind barbs from two bands of raster data sets, having the two projections, and uh, um, do complicated stuff with it, more complicated stuff. I mean, this is one style with a, a lot of functions embedding into it, computing square roots and whatnot to, to get all the parameters it needs. Uh, you can do heat maps, uh, starting from points. 
you can do uh, discrete point interpolations. You, we have the point stacker if you wanted to aggregate many points into a single point, and so on. If you are not happy with this, the WPS is extensible. The processes are an interface. You can implement your own. So uh, out of the box, GeoServer supports a, a styling format called SLD, which is really intended for computers. So we really don't want to see you ever edit one of these files by hand. Um, instead, we, we recommend one here called GeoCSS, uh, which looks a lot like the CSS you lose, use for HTML uh, pages. There's also one I like called YSLD. Uh, because why use SLD? Uh, we've got a YAML flavor of SLD, which allows uh, you know, you can convert your SLD files to, to this and back. And there's also one called Mapbox GL, which I need to rename to Map Library. Um, and that's really nice because it allows you to use the same style for server-side rendering and for client-side rendering of vector tiles. Um, there's a little bit of an option to convert around. So SLD 1.1 and Mapbox styles can be converted to SLD. Um, and then uh, YSLD can be converted back and forth. We can also technically implement a, a translation between SLD and uh, GeoCSS, like from SLD to GeoCSS. We are waiting for someone to either uh, put their time on it or fund this development. But now it's technically feasible. A few years ago, the way it wasn't. Um, right. So this is the one where we've got SLD named layers for style groups. Uh, so if you actually, you can completely define a map using an SLD file, so you can actually just upload an entire map definition to GeoServer and get it rendered. It's an interesting feature of WMS. Right, and you can do so also with Mapbox GL. Um, you can also, uh, that allows you to combine several styles together to form a single map. So you're, when you upload an SLD or a Mapbox style, uh, you can pull data from all over the place. Uh, there's styling references and cookbooks and workshops included in our user manual, so please don't hesitate to dive in. Uh, marks, there's all kinds of built-in marks. Uh, circles and squares come out of the box, but there's also uh, custom ones for wind barbs and so on. And you can also define your own marks and so on inline and, or use true type fonts. Um, okay, so we also support multidimensional data, whether or not you're ready. Uh, so multidimensional data typically comes with time and elevation dimensions that you can use to slice the data set and look at them in WMS, WMTS, or download them through WCS. Through WCS, you can also download uh, the, the full data set with all the dimensions using NetCTF as an output. Um, the symbology is uh, meteorology ready, uh, so you can make the, the maps that you need. And uh, let's switch to security. Right. Uh, if you're publishing information on the web, generally you want to share it with everyone, but occasionally, occasionally you don't. So uh, we've got a full security model. Uh, you can, uh, a nice thing about GeoServer, in addition to the security we've got built into GeoServer, we also have a great attitude of allowing GeoServer to integrate in with whatever security system you're using uh, in your organization. So for authentication, you could check with a database, LDAP, Active Directory, certificates, you could trust your application server. Uh, there's some OAuth things lurking off in the community modules. We've got lots of different integration options for GeoServer. In terms of authorization, we've got a simple kind of user role uh, permission model built in. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, an option called Geofence, which you can choose to either run remotely or embed in GeoServer. And that's a really interesting one. It allows you to geofence, maybe give people edit permission, but just within a specific area of interest that they're responsible for. In terms of uh, reliability of the code base, we have invested a lot in quality assurance uh, with the uh, unit tests to the point that running the test is uh, taking the vast majority of the build time. Uh, we have a continuous build box. We have a, also GitHub actions and whenever we do a pull request. Every pull request is manually code reviewed. Uh, and here are the uh, automatic checks. And uh, yeah, all of this that we talked about is free. Yeah, it is. It is, and that's actually a real feature of GeoServer. Uh, we are open source. Uh, we're actually uh, free as in freedom. Um, yeah, GPL license. So this doesn't get said often enough, even at a Phosphor-G conference. Being freely available really is a superpower of GeoServer. Uh, it's why we're all here. Uh, so free as in beer. Um, and yeah. 
Doesn't this make you want to, to contribute to this uh, great endeavor? So <laughs> if you want to contribute and you can code, uh, look at the contributing.md uh, file uh, on GitHub, and uh, there is a checklist of what uh, you could be doing or get in touch on the developer list. If you have money and want to donate a new feature, uh, get in touch with the commercial support providers, our co-contributors, experience provider, or uh, the ones are providing additional services. If you just have money and want to donate it, uh, let us do whatever is best. There is a donation button, uh, and you can even get um, an invoice if you, if you so need to through OSGIO. And uh, that does qualify you to be recognized as an OSGIO sponsor as well, so because we're an OSGIO project. And uh, if you cannot code and you don't have money but you still want to contribute, yes, we can. Uh, uh, we are happy to receive your help. Uh, community projects uh, uh, live on documentation, so you can improve the documentation. You can answer user questions either on the user list or on Stack Exchange. You can check the tickets that come in in the back tracker and see if they can be actually reproduced. Um, try the releases, translations, and so on. So there is a lot to be done, even if you cannot code. One of the biggest things you can do is when we release a release candidate, that's when we're really looking for feedback from the public and when the developers can really use a hand testing. I guess we're through to questions. Yes.